right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Those who might be new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and around the world. So over the summer, we've been doing a handful of events, and we're really excited for September when we get back to a normal schedule of 30 to 50 live events uh, for classrooms everywhere, whether you're joining us from home or whether you'll be joining us from in the classroom or a hybrid uh, of both. So for the last, I'd say two or three months now, we've been partnered with the Duke Lemur Center and we've been hosting events every Thursday at 10 o'clock Eastern, learning about research going on in Madagascar, research at the, uh, the Duke Lemur Center as well. We've been having events where we've connected with paleontologists. They have an incredible fossil collection at the Duke Lemur Center. And uh, we've also been getting out into the lemur forest and meeting some of the, the lemur species that they do have right on campus. So if you're not familiar with the Duke Lemur Center, it was founded in 1966 on the campus of the Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. It's a world leader in the study, care, and protection of lemurs, Earth's most threatened group of mammals. So on site, there's more than 200 animals across 14 species, which is the largest and most diverse population of lemurs outside of their native Madagascar. And today we have a really interesting event on deck. Uh, about a month and a half ago or so, we connected with James Herrera. He is the project coordinator for the Saba Conservation Initiative. And today he's going to talk to us a little bit about how they've had to adjust uh, with COVID-19, uh, you know, adjust to the project and adjust uh, to the new conditions. So I'm going to pop James here into the call. Good morning, James. How are you doing? Great. Hi, everyone. Really great to be back on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. All right. Well, it's great to have you joining us today. Um, we're looking forward to learning a little bit more about, you know, how plans have changed and, and how uh, people are adjusting to COVID, uh, you know, in Madagascar and around the project. Great. Well, thank you for this opportunity to share all these updates um, because, yeah, it's been a really difficult year around the globe and uh, Madagascar has definitely faced a lot of challenges this year. We at Duke have faced challenges in how to maximize our conservation efforts uh, both in the U.S. and in Madagascar. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our updates, and hopefully I'll have a chance to uh, update you again in a few weeks because we have a lot on deck, actually. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how Saba Conservation has been adapting to and responding to COVID in, in, in this year. Um, but I'm going to really start by saying that this is the story of a lot of diligent and resilient Malagasy people that have made this work possible despite all the challenges, all the obstacles. And so number one is Lantu Anjian Anjasana. He's uh, the pro project coordinator for the Sava Conservation Program. And he's been with the team since 2011. He's a seasoned conservationist and he's very well adapted to managing the projects all on his own anyway. Uh, but he's really um, taken uh, this load and carried it really, really well uh, during the last few seven, eight months really. And of course, our conservation coordinator, Charlie Welsh, we, we wouldn't be able to do things uh, without him. He's got 30 years of experience weathering storms like political instability, um, epidemics, economic crises, and more. Uh, so his experience and patience and his caution and, and care for the Malagasy people have um, really helped to shape what we've been doing this year. So I thank them a lot. These are our, our main staff in, in Madagascar, but we also have uh, several new members of the team. So this is Everard Benesovina, and he is uh, um, a, a local person from Sambaba who's a research assistant, a tourist guide, and just passionate about conservation. He's creating his own interpretive center for teaching students about conservation and the environment. And we're really happy to have him on board and Torian Rabe Manansua, who has been an agricultural spe specialist uh, partnering with us to help with all the agricultural projects I'll tell you about. So I really, uh, this is their story. They have been the ones doing all the hard work while, um, while I've been uh, sidelined here in the U.S. Uh, because Madagascar has been closed since March. So I also want to uh, tell you a little bit and give a lot of thanks to the CURSA team. That's the university in the northeast of Madagascar. I'm going to be saying that word a lot, CURSA. And um, it's, you know, it stands for the French words for their regional university. And this is Christophe Manzari Bay here. He's the new director. He's got a PhD in ecology focused on reforestation, really has conservation at heart. 
and he's got a tremendous staff of teachers that are also biologists like Full Johns here. He's a herpetologist studying amphibians and reptiles. Um, this is a Marie Roland. She's a botanist studying carbon sequestration in the forest. Uh, Tulcha is also a botanist. He's interested in a lot of different aspects of the reforestation. And this is uh, Nestorine, who is a specialist in nutrition. And these are just a small handful of the, the group of really dedicated teachers and staff at the university that we've had the pleasure of partnering with. And of course, we couldn't do any of this work without the support of uh, viewers like you. Uh, the DLC Saba program is 100% funded by grants and donations. And um, we've been very, very fortunate to have support from a really tight uh, network of, of people who care about conservation. And if, if you're one of them, please share the word and let people know about what we're doing because um, the, the folks in Madagascar need all the help that we can get right now. So with that, I'll give you a little outline of, of where we're going with this talk. First, I'll, I'll update you about the COVID situation in Madagascar and then how we've been adapting, uh, especially how we've been uh, working with um, local healthcare practitioners to provide them with the PPE they need, the personal protective equipment, and all the participants in our activities, how we're doing information campaigns to get the word out there about COVID. And then what are the activities we've been able to keep going uh, despite uh, all the challenges? These include reforestation efforts, workshops in uh, agroecology, and I'll explain what that is later, as well as environmental education and more. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the next steps for the rest of 2020 and beyond. So with that, uh, I'll just turn to the Madagascar COVID situation. Uh, and first I have to give a lot of um, uh, credit to uh, these three Malagasy researchers. And there's a lot of other great international researchers involved in this project, but especially like Fidi and Tanzanar, colleagues of mine that I have the pleasure of working with in the past. Um, they've, they've combed the data that are available to make it accessible for Malagasy people. You know, that's, it's not quite like here in the U.S. where we get a, an update every hour on the number of cases. Uh, especially at first, it was very hard to get good quality data on the number of cases and the situation. So they created this online dashboard or portal that uh, is constantly updating with the latest numbers. And so just to give you a little bit of a timeline, you know, early on, this is uh, going back to May, uh, March, excuse me, you know, Madagascar is very proactive. They shut down their borders to a lot of travel early on in February. By March, they had totally closed borders. And it wasn't until mid-March when they did some repatriation flights that COVID actually got into the island. And then we saw this slow burn into the population where these, you know, this number, this is the number of cases here, uh, under 200 per day. But we have to remember that the healthcare infrastructure in Madagascar is um, not what we see in high-income countries. So the amount of testing is, is a significant obstacle. And Fidi actually just shared in a, a tweet recently that, you know, Yes, the number of cases appear to be going down in Madagascar, but so have the number of tests. And as we know in uh, the US, testing is really important to, to have a good quality uh, figure on what the real number of cases are. Again, many Malagasy people are, when they get sick, they stay home. They don't have money to go to the doctor. And so we're not getting those kinds of records of, of the stay at home cases. So it's really important to have these data available and uh, really amazing that the, this team put the data together and made them publicly accessible. So here's a heat map showing the different regions of Madagascar where the red is the highest number of cases. That's Antananarivo, the capital. So you can imagine high population density. Um, that's where you see the most cases. And also into the east here where there's a lot of traffic for commerce and things. So, you know, one of the things that Madagascar has been great about doing is shutting down inter-regional travel. All domestic flights have been closed. Even local public transportation like buses were closed. Uh, for a very long time, and only now are they starting to open up. Strict lockdowns and curfews, businesses operating on uh, restricted hours, masks, the whole, the whole nine yards, even despite all the challenges of doing this in a, a remote country like this. Um, but, you know, along with the economic shutdown, I mean, tourism is one of the biggest um, uh, sources of uh, external revenue to the US, to Madagascar. So without tourism, without a lot of international commerce and trade, Madagascar has been suffering economically. And that suffering comes out in illegal activities in, in natural resource management and especially in national parks. 
So this figure here, uh, all these little uh, polygons or blobs are different national parks and they're color coded by the number of fires this year in comparison to last year. So the red are places that have really high uh, uh, fire frequency this year compared to the same time last year. And this is a really great project by a group in Helsinki that's uh, really taking these live data that are available from NASA on fires and constantly updating so we have almost a real time um, assessment of the impacts. What does this look like on the ground? Uh, well, especially in Western Madagascar where it's very dry, uh, these, especially in the dry season, these forests are like tinder boxes. And uh, when a wire, wildfire gets out, it'll really wipe out an area. These are the famous baobabs in the background, just the only things that will remain after these bushfires. And I'll point out that the, the photos to follow all come from the social media pages of the Madagascar Ministry of Environment, Madagascar National Parks. So they're putting the word out there about what's going on and, and how hard they're working to try to, 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 um, to prevent these kinds of illegal activities despite all the challenges. So uh, a lot of the fires can occur because of fires that break out from charcoal production. So these huge logs have been cut to create charcoal. They get buried underground and lit on fire. So they slow burn into those big chunks of charcoal you're probably familiar with. More than 80% and more like 90% are of people in Madagascar are still cook with charcoal. And so this is, there's a huge demand. This is a great source of income for people. And uh, you know, this is an unsustainable practice currently. Sometimes you'll see huge, massive areas that have been logged and, and for the creation of charcoal. And there's just a huge demand. I mean, 25 million people in Madagascar, most of them using charcoal. One sack like this, um, uh, which is like 60, 70, upwards of 100 pounds, um, will, will last a, a, the average family about a month, if not less. And, um, and they cost, you know, a, a significant amount for, for the average family. Uh, you'll see trucks full of them just uh, shipping them all over the island. So this is a significant source of pressure. Uh, also logging for timber trees, uh, the precious wood like rosewood and ebony. Uh, this is still a huge problem and really the only places where precious wood still exists are deep inside the national parks. So when you find trees like this, lumber like this in, in these big trucks, it's most likely coming from national parks. Wildlife trafficking has also been on the, uh, 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 the significant problem. These are endemic uh, ducks, endangered ducks from Madagascar that were captured. Uh, along with the ducks here are um, tenrics. These guys look like hedgehogs, but they're actually a unique group of mammals only found in Madagascar. They're really fascinating and they're unfortunately often hunted for food. And um, so, you know, the next picture is a little grim. It's a little gruesome. And I apologize if you're squeamish, you might want to cover your eyes for a second. But um, illegal poaching of lemurs is also a big problem. Um, lemurs are, you know, hunted for their meat. Sometimes it's for uh, restaurants and cities where people like to have fancy exotic meats, but most of the time it's actually just subsistence farmers, farmers who live on the forest frontier. It's tradition for them to hunt animals and that's their really only sources of meat and protein sometimes. So it's, it's a difficult balance to, um, to compensate, you know, biodiversity conservation and the needs of local populations. And that's what I'm going to be focusing most of the rest of the talk on. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and uh, give, uh, if there's anyone in the audience that has any questions, I'll, I'll take questions just about the COVID updates uh, so far. And I'll let you know that the next part of the talk is going to be all about what we're, what we're doing about it. So if you have any questions on that, you can hold on to those. All right, perfect. Well, James, thanks for sharing that update to start. So just a shout out to the viewers I can see who are tuning in via Facebook Live, via YouTube Live. Use those chat sidebars, introduce yourself, let us know where you're viewing from. Uh, if you want to send in a question or two now or send in some questions uh, after James completes the next part of the call, um, go for it. I'm going to pop Genevieve and Juliet in from Oshawa. Just let them say hi. How are you doing today, girls? We're good. How are you? All right. Good, good. So just give me a wave when you have a question, okay? When the time comes. Okay. okay. Perfect. So James, let's uh, you know start right away with a question here about you know you often hear that um, some human diseases can be transferred between humans. 
uh, and primate. Is there any evidence so far to suggest that that's possible with humor? Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, you, you bring up a fundamental point about this whole coronavirus um, and, and many uh, pandemics like it. This one, this is a, a disease known as a zoonotic disease. It means it comes from animals and it's changed. It, it spilled over into people. So we're, you know, we're, we're still learning about which animals are most susceptible to this coronavirus, which ones may have potential for transmission. Um, we're really worried about it with great apes because great apes are so similar to humans in terms of immunity and just about everything else that, um, that they are susceptible to all the same diseases that we are, and if not more susceptible. So it's a real challenge there. In terms of lemurs, so far there's uh, been very little research. There was one paper that's still, I think, in preprint, meaning it's not fully proven yet, but there are a number of primates that have a genetic, a number of lemurs, including the Shifaka, that which is one of DLC's uh, uh, flagship species, that have a genetic marker related to the immune system that looks very similar to the human uh, gene. And so it's, it's, it's preliminary and it's uh, indirect evidence, but it suggests that they may also be susceptible to the coronavirus. That's why you've seen at DLC, everybody's wearing masks when they're working with the animals. There's actually even one uh, US researcher, I know Mariah, I'll give her a shout out. She's, she's been in Madagascar this, this, during this whole pandemic and she's shifted her research to testing that exact question, can lemurs get COVID? So we'll, we'll stay tuned for more updates from Mariah. All right. So you shared, you know, one of the issues that's happening right now, which is uh, an increase in fires. Um, we do a few different factors. Now, as a whole in Madagascar, are there a lot of species that, of plant species that are fire adapted? Is this kind of a natural cycle, but just right now there's more happening than usual? Super cool question. Yeah, I love to get into the deep time questions like what what is natural for Madagascar? Um, because we, as, as you've learned from Matt Bortz in previous uh, posts, you know, we, we really don't know. We have very little fossil record from Madagascar. What we do have shows that there have been periods in time, and we're talking about tens of thousands of years, where you see like in the fossil record, this big band of charcoal, meaning there was lots of fires at that time. And then you'll get a period with none and, and you know, other um, biogeochemical uh, signatures tell us that there were wet periods. And then there's a shift to another dry period and charcoal formed again. So it's a really fascinating question. Um, and it does seem like there are plants to go straight to your question. There are plants that are pretty fire adapted, um, including there's, um, there, there's a species from the highlands called tapia or tapia wapaka. Um, that appears to have some resilience. I mean, we're, we're you know, there's always a, a limit, but maybe they were fire adapted. Um, there's um, a, a type of palm called the Bismarck palm that grows out in the Midwest part of Madagascar and it seems pretty fire adapted. So there's actually a really recent paper about this, um, trying to clarify some of the debate about what is natural savanna in Madagascar and what is uh, human induced, what is from, from deforestation. And actually there are a lot of native grasses that are adapted to fire. They need fire to propagate. And that's not unusual. We see that in a lot of other places in the world where fire is a natural component. So long-winded answer, answer to say there is some natural component, but the frequencies we're seeing are definitely not natural. And, and it's only gonna get worse with the economic impacts and with climate change. You know, with climate change, we are predicting that seasons are gonna get um, unpredictable, dry seasons will be longer, rain will be less. So it's regionally varying too. So, you know, it's, it's a fascinating question. It keeps researchers up at night. You know, what is natural in Madagascar? And um, I don't have the full answer, but hopefully that gives you some, some glimpses into that, that deep question. Yeah. And so we'll hit you with one more question, James, before we let you continue. And this kind of allude, you know, this is kind of based on on what you shared with us just before we put the question. Are um, you know different conservation groups? Are you guys looking at uh, whether there's an increase, you know, in the poaching species like the tenorac, like the lemur, you know, maybe in, kind of induced by the, a change in the economic situation with COVID? Uh, another great one with, that I wish we had the answer for. Um, 
to really answer that question, and I'm putting on my, my real hardcore experimental biologist hat, we would need to have good data from before the pandemic on hunting to compare the data after. And there are only a handful of groups that I can think of off the top of my head, research groups that have been tracking the bushmeat, poaching, the hunting for years and years. And this is uh, folks like Chris Golden at Harvard and uh, Courtney Borgerson, who's at um, um, in New Jersey, I'm blanking, sorry, I'm on the spot. But she, you know, she's another professor working on this bushmeat um, work, and they have data from before. And you know, I'll, I'll have to poll them and see if they're continuing to collect the long-term data through this pandemic to see if we do see trends. Uh, anecdotally, however, meaning like just from what people are telling me, yes, there's there. You know, when when the national park are doing these patrols around the park, they're catching, they're finding snares all over. You know, they'll make these kind of noose snares that catch the lemurs. Um, they hunt uh, tenrix, you know, using dogs and things like that that can sniff them out of their burrows. So I'm hearing a lot, but I don't have hard data at this point, but I'll let you know in the future. Yeah. Oh, no, it's definitely early, but, you know, I have no doubt that there's different groups who are looking at that right now and, and hoping to collect some data. Mm -hmm. um, so one more question just before we go in. Terry's tuning in via Facebook and was curious, have you come across any any literature or, or, or anything about other great apes that that you know may like they're looking at whether they can contract COVID or, or any evidence so far? You know, I've, I've, I've been so Madagascar focused for so long that I haven't kept up with, with what we're finding with COVID in the great apes. I'm gonna speculate and it's not um, just out of nowhere. It's because, you know, we know that the great apes are susceptible to even just influenza um, and, you know, the common cold. And, you know, there's all these, um, uh, viruses and bacteria that humans get and that we can easily spread to great apes. I mean, especially like with the mountain gorillas, all the research guides and, and tourists must always wear masks to, to prevent the potential spread to the animals and keep a good distance. So I'm, I'm guessing that there is significant research being done, but probably a lot of the work with the great apes right now is just trying to maintain those boundaries. I mean, I've actually been hearing about upticks in gorilla poaching as well. You know, the real threat right now is just all the economies are crashing and people are hurting and they're turning to whatever means they can to, to survive. And so I've heard about uh, upticks in poaching as well. All right, James, I'm gonna pop your presentation back into the event and we'll let you take over for another uh, chunk. Great, thank you. And uh, you know, if, if there are any burning questions in the middle of the talk, like and, and students raising their hands, please let me know, I'm happy to pause too. So now I'm gonna to turn to what we've been doing. How have we adapted to this situation? And I'm gonna say that the first few weeks were really just a scary pause. We all held our breath uh, because um, we know what the healthcare situation is like in Madagascar. And, and uh, unfortunately, even with just a few hundred cases a day, that's already overburdening their healthcare infrastructure. So we really had to second guess and reprioritize everything we did to say, is this worth it? Including my own travel to Madagascar, to say, is this worth it? Uh, what are the risks to the local populations? Um, and we've restricted pretty much everything to whatever local communities are comfortable with. You know, there are national guidelines restricting the size of meetings of less than 30 people. We always adhere to things like that. But you know, no matter what, if a, if a community tells us we're afraid of the COVID, we don't, we're not having any outsiders, then we, we respect that. Um, but a lot of them have actually reached out to us to tell us about their, their needs and the challenges they're facing. So one of the first things that we've been working on is support for healthcare workers. We know that everywhere they're on the front line. They're the ones going in every day, unsure of the patients they're going to see and the challenges they're going to face. So we're trying to provide them with the personal protective equipment, the PPE that they need, the masks, gloves, uh, hand sanitizing stations, and also like uh, information campaigns, providing infographics and things like that. Um, we, we were approached early on by a local youth uh, volunteer group uh, from the Sam Sambava area that they were really concerned and interested to help um, with the local hospital in Sambava. And we partnered with them to donate masks and other supplies to the hospital. They were extremely grateful. Um, we also, everywhere we go, we distribute these infographic posters 
They're super easy to read, written in Malagasy, all about the symptoms um, so that people know if they actually have COVID versus any other um, diseases that they're already facing, like malaria, for example. How to prevent the, how it's how it's spread in the first place by close contact and handshaking, and how to spread it, uh, how to prevent the spread. Um, and uh, speaking of the question we just got earlier, like where did this disease come from in the first place? A lot of organizations like WWF are reminding us that the that the diseases that we're seeing now, these zoonotics, are an environmental issue. Uh, when people go into the forests and hunt animals, um, and and bring these animals into markets, you're increasing the chances for the exposure to a virus or a disease like coronavirus. We're not sure still, but we're pretty sure coronavirus came from a wild animal that was hunted, brought into a market. And when you have all these animals together in unsanitary conditions and lots of people, uh, the chances are very high that there could be a disease spillover. So again, we're trying to, to, to close those gaps to make it clear why environment is important for more than just lemurs, but also public health. We work very closely with the Marie Stokes International, which is an organization that supports uh, women's reproductive health. And so we've been partnering with them for years to facilitate their nurses going out to remote rural villages and consulting with women about reproductive health, about their needs, and now also spreading information about uh, coronavirus. So everywhere they go, they're providing masks for the women during these consultations, hand washing stations, and the posters. Mm -hmm. And we've actually got a really exciting plan for coming up in the next few weeks. We're going to do some radio announcements, and we're teaming up with a, a local network of doctors and biologists focused on that, that uh, intersection of environment and health to target several uh, remote rural clinics that we have identified are, are extremely under-equipped and are serving very large populations. And we're going to donate a lot of the PPE. We're going to do a lot of these information campaigns there in the, in the coming weeks. So st stay tuned to, to, to the Duke Lemur Center Facebook for more updates. But getting more into the conservation arm of this, you know, what are we doing about all that activity in the national parks? Well, we, we can't do much. We're an NGO, but the Madagascar National Park is the service that is in charge of, of maintaining these parks. And they are very uh, open with us. We exchange a lot of information and ideas, and they're alerting us to the activities going on in the park. When they go out and do patrols, they collect all this information, they've compiled the the data into databases that we are now helping to figure out how do we better and more efficiently patrol and monitor these remote areas. So the Madagascar National Park agents, um, uh, even military and police are among those in these patrols in the picture, but I especially want to highlight what's called the CLP, the Community Local du Parc, with some folks that I uh, know very well and I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, these are local folks from the villages bordering the national park who basically volunteer to protect the park. They, they have it in their heart that the park is important and they keep an eye out. They report to the MNP when they see illegal activities and they can mount these big patrols. And it really takes a big, strong army like this because they're going up against loggers that have guns. They're risking their lives sometimes and they're uncovering a, a lot of illegal activity. So this is uh, illegal logging for rosewood. Rosewood is a precious wood famous around the world and it's still one that's uh, bleeding out of Madagascar. Uh, and also farming, farming being done deep inside of the national park in these remote areas. Because travel has been so restricted, the economy shut down, many government offices shut down, the ability to monitor these remote areas has really seen a, a big restriction. And so we're just trying to help every way we can to provide resources for the National Park Service. And one thing they've uh, come to us about is about park, park boundary markers, signs about the park limits. Early on in the Duke Lemur Center partnership with the MNP, uh, we helped to um, uh, uh, distribute these signs, which are placed all along the perimeter of this tremendous 50,000 hectare park. Um, so it's a lot of work. And it at least makes clear to the local communities where the boundary of the national park is, because that's often not clear in these far off areas. Well, we found out that during some of these patrols, uh, the MMP has found that over 80 of the signs in, in one particular 
illegal hotspot have just been destroyed or lost. People, you know, probably stole them so that it makes those park limits even more uh, unclear. So we're going to work with the local authorities and the MMP to get new signs uh, posted to reinforce those park boundaries and reinforce the patrol. Uh, during my first talk with Exploring by the Seed of Your Pants, um, I talked about the Madagascar's ambitious nationwide commitment to plant four zillion hectares. No, I'm just kidding, but it really is a, an amazingly uh, ambitious plan of millions and millions of hectares of reforestation. And they're really doing it. I mean, in January, um, this is a scene from just outside the capital where hundreds of volunteers came out and planted hundreds of thousands of, of trees in this plantation, and it happened across the island. Um, in the Saba region, in the northeast where we work, um, over 200, we were able to compile data from over 200, uh, all the different uh, partners, and they reported to us that over 200,000 seedlings were, uh, were planted on over 100 hectares of public land. Sorry, I keep saying hectares, that's the metric version of acres, where 100 hectares is about 240 acres. So that's a lot of land. It's spread out in six plantations all across Saba, which makes it a little more challenging to... To, to maintain, but uh, having a greater reach and impact. And so uh, DLC helped out early on by working with the local partners in their tree nurseries, supplying uh, the materials needed like the soil compost pots um, and volunteering uh, lots and lots of hands to help out in the nurseries. And now we are working very closely with CURSA again to conduct the follow-ups, the evaluations, the monitoring that is so important you know, it's one thing to go and plant hundreds of thousands of trees. It's another thing to maintain them and keep them growing over decades. So it, after about six months from the planting, uh, CURSA developed an evaluation scheme that we uh, partnered with them on. And they sent students, uh, faculty, and instructors out to all these plantations to go and do inventories, evaluate the, the survival rates. And here is just a, a, a all too typical scene in the Sava region where despite the lush rainforest up in the national park, most areas outside of national parks are really degraded like this. And believe it or not, in this uh, grassy hill, which has probably been cut and burned for generations, uh, there's tons of little seedlings planted. So the students are doing their due diligence to go out, they're measuring the distance between seedlings, uh, and believe it or not, in, in lost in all these grasses, there are hundreds of thousands of seedlings and they're actually doing pretty well. Um, at one of the sites, I had the, the privilege of visiting this particular site on John Usada before I left Madagascar and I could already see that the people were very committed to this site. I mean, they planted more than 50,000 trees in the past three years. However, like too many other places in the world, Invasive weeds are a big problem. These grasses that you see here, as tall as a student is, uh, are totally smothering uh, these seedlings and they're struggling. You know, even this seedling that I'm looking at here, this is a rosewood. Trees that have uh, been classically logged almost to the point of disappearing, they're trying to bring them back. So we are uncovering via this evaluation, the next steps. We've got to maintain, we've got to go clear these uh, invasive grasses so that these trees have a fighting chance. Um, we also found that, you know, sometimes the circumstances are not all that great for planting trees. So in one site, they were out there doing the plantation and a giant storm erupted and everybody, you know, ran for cover and about 2000 seedlings were left uh, that are still not planted. So now we're mounting a mission to go and get those seedlings planted, make sure that they are surviving. This is another site where you might not believe this is in the Sava region where we have lush rainforests, but due to the degradation of the land, they're also experiencing a desertification. So in these areas where the earth has just been overused and abused, all you have is this hard packed dry clay. And, you know, they've chosen trees that are adapted to these dry conditions, but these trees need some care. They need some compost and mulch, and we're going to come back and, and really take care of them so that they're not, you know, the sun isn't beating down on this hard packed earth. Uh, so there's lots more to do there. We're also going to build fire breaks all around national parks to, excuse me, not around the national park, around the plantation area so that we can protect it from those bushfires coming in. Here's just a quick summary of, of the success of these tree plantations. 
at six different sites. Uh, there's a, a, over 100 hectares that have been planted and over 118,000 seedlings that have successfully established in these first uh, six to eight months. So it's really inspiring. And like I said, this is only the first step. Now we're going to go back and work even harder to, to make sure those seedlings make it to next year. I'm going to shift gears a little bit to talk more about um, agroecology, and I'll explain that more in a minute. But, you know, before I was kind of talking more about restoration. We're just trying to bring trees back and forests back on these landscapes. Here we're talking about agriculture mixed with that kind of reforestation. And we've long partnered with a primary school, first to fifth graders, in a school in Andapa called Bayloka, which means the big fish. Um, and this group has a PTA, a Parent Teacher Association, that is super dedicated to conservation. They have, um, uh, there's about 25 PTA members, and we held a workshop with them uh, where we had three CURSA students engaged, three instructors, and our, our project coordinator, Alonto. And so just to back up, what is agroecology? Well, I like to think about agroecology as the fusion of farming and nature, and the recognition that we are talking about an agro ecosystem. So nature for billions of years has been uh, recycling and maximizing nutrients and resources and plants are extremely efficient at, at this process. So they take in the energy from the sun and they turn it into biomass, living biological stuff. And when that stuff falls and uh, de decomposes in the soil, it returns that energy into the soil where soil organisms can break it down into the minerals and nutrients that the plants then take up with their roots and recycle. And it's a system uh, where there's feedbacks. And we can maximize that system. We can maximize our agriculture by staying in tune to nature. So we can plant these important food crops like corn, cassava, rice, beans, and fruits, um, you know, in line with these trees that are producing the things we need. Other valuable trees that we call cash crops include coffee and cacao, which is where chocolate comes from. These trees actually need shade. They grow better in the shade of a forest. So we can do what's called agroforestry, where we're planting trees that provide the shade and the nutrients for these important crops that provide a lot of income for people. And then things like banana trees also grow great in a shady foresty environment and are staple food in, in Madagascar. And so in this system, we're also promoting biodiversity. And we're not just talking about lemurs in the cacao plantations, but just the, the biodiversity that doesn't always um, catch the charismatic pictures um, like the bees and butterflies that do all our pollinating, the birds that are dispersing seeds, the bats that are eating a significant number of the insect pests, and so on and so on. So it's really about maximizing the ecosystem services that nature provides for the farmer for free. So back to Bay Loca, of course, we're always trying to be mindful of COVID. Everyone gets masks, hand sanitizing, and um, information about COVID before they come in. And here's Christoph again. He's leading uh, in the instruction to teach about tree planting from start to finish, from choosing the right seeds of diverse species to how to take care of them in the nursery and how to plant and, and take care of them over decades. This is uh, Michel uh, uh, Besonia, and he is an um, extremely successful uh, entrepreneur from the Saba region who has a huge plantation of cacao, coffee, cloves, you name it, he, he's got it. And he's really brilliant, mostly self-taught, um, but he's done experiments on his own land to figure out how to maximize yield and, and productivity. And, you know, this is not as easy as just planting trees uh, at random in the landscape. He's got a very specific design, distance between trees and the way of positioning them, given the slope in the landscape, to maximize productivity. And the first time I met him, he reeled off numbers in French and Malagasy doing math about how many seedlings per square meter that I was just blown away. He also knows every variety or varietal of the cacao. This is actually what chocolate looks like before it comes your Hershey bar. These are the fruits and inside those are the seeds. There's a number of different varieties and hybrids with different qualities that he explained. 
He also took the participants out to the nursery to explain how to choose the seedlings that are ready to plant. So this is the Bayloka School Nursery where they've produced over 2,000 seedlings this year. Here's coffee right here in the front and cacao in the back, cloves up here, that's another important spice, and native trees that provide the shade and bring in the, the biodiversity. I just want to point out, you know, we try to really enforce masks and, and physical distancing. We take every opportunity to be outside where we can get a little distance, um, but it is really challenging as we're all facing. And I'll just also point out that in these rural villages, most people are family members. These are people that live in the same household. And so um, they find it kind of comical when we try to tell them to keep a one meter distance during the workshop because they all go home and sleep in the same room together. So this is, um, you know, it's we're working within the cultural context. And I also forgot to point out that Saba so far has been very lucky. There's only been about 30 cases, but we're still taking maximum precautions um, within the local context. So anyway, um, here's Christoph again, never afraid to get his hands dirty and neither of the students. So that, like I said, three students were involved and even just demonstrating how to properly dig the holes. Like this is not just dig a hole and stick the tree in there. You should actually be digging the hole twice or three times as big as the root ball of the tree, because then you're going to fill that hole with lots of soft compost and good soil that's going to give that seedling the fighting chance it needs to survive. You know, putting them into that hard compacted earth directly um, is, is why we see low survival rates. And we're not looking for 50% survival, we're looking for 99.9% .9 survival. So this is how we do it. And the students were so motivated um, that they are really um, looking to continue to participate. So we planted 40 trees in the school's uh, demonstration garden, which is right next to the school, so the kids can all see how it's, how it's working and help take care. And we also distributed 400 seedlings to each of the participants, to each of the PTA, that they can go plant in their own land. And it's their personal trees. And so those students that were involved are so interested and really enjoyed their experience with the community that they are now going back to do follow-up consultations with the farmers to make sure that the farmers, you know, understand everything and give the farmers the help they need to really do it right. Um, and the, the students are great. Then they just got back from a mission and they're just so enthusiastic. Talking about fish farming before we're talking about tree farming, now fish farming. So I talked about the poaching and how important the wild uh, meat sources are for people. Well, we're trying to help out with an alternative in the form of fish. So there are a lot of fish. This is a parrot tilapia that's native to Madagascar that we've been working on farming, but also in you know, non-native species that are fast growing. And uh, at this school, since 2017, we've been working on a fish farm. But on top of coronavirus and on top of the economic crash, there was also a cyclone or hurricane in, in the Saba region. And that cyclone wasn't too bad, but it did cause a lot of flooding and a lot of landslides. And the, the ponds that they had built uh, either overflowed, some of the retaining walls broke. So they had to be significantly repaired. And here's the PTA, you know, knee deep in the mud, redigging these ponds, which is really a lot of work. And they did a fantastic job. Uh, they really put it back together. And so we were so motivated that we, um, led another workshop. So this is Fidel. He's a fish farming specialist from the region. And he trained the group several years ago, but he's come back out to, to start from scratch, basically, make sure everybody's on the same page and restock those ponds. And we do a lot of education for not just the kids, but the adults. So here he's explaining some pretty uh, significant scientific concepts for farmers in the remote countryside that, you know, um, our own data suggests about 70% of, of these farmers um, only get the opportunity to get a primary school education. So these kinds of concepts like food webs are uh, not necessarily something that they're uh, well versed in, but they get it, they get it. And, and Fidel is able to combine the science with their local traditional ecological knowledge to, to, to close those gaps in, in, uh, between the different kinds of knowing. So here he's, he's explaining, you know, in Malagasy, Uluna, the people, we can create compost, the zhezhko, which gives all these different essential elements and nutrients that allows the plants in the water, the phytoplankton, to grow 
and support the zooplankton, which are then the food for the fish. So he's combined pretty cool food chain um, systems thinking to the fish farm. And the, the, the teaching, the parent-teacher association, they're always really thrilled with these opportunities and they're really engaged and, and enthusiastic. They, they did a great job. These ponds may look a little uh, murky to us in the West, but these are actually really great ponds. They're loaded with organics that are gonna kickstart um, a productive pond. And we got 400 fish fries or baby fish in the pond. Four months later, they're almost ready to harvest. So we're about to do another workshop on proper harvesting. Um, fish farming is one aspect. Another aspect that we're working on is a vegetable gardening using small home gardens. And we focus on the home garden because that's where they are almost every day. They can maintain and, and take care of the garden and they can also reap some benefits by harvesting every day a little bit of vegetables for the dinner table. So again, here's Christoph uh, presenting um, the, the team to the local population. And this is actually one of the villages where if you tuned in for my first talk, we had done training back in November, November with the, um, the um, Terra Firma International Consulting Organization and Peter Jensen who came out and we led training, we made model gardens and we've continued to do evaluations ever since, and we've seen the challenges that people have faced. We've learned how we can adapt what we learned in November to what works in this local situation. And we've seen you know, the steps that people need a little uh, refresher, reminder about, and the steps that, that we can kind of develop as, as we build new skills. So this was kind of a refresher workshop um, where Christoph is explaining all about the meaning of agroecology and Latu is here to explain how this is related to our conservation goals. And again, five students from the local university also participated and Torian that I was mentioning earlier. He's our agricultural trainer right now. And so um, we also distributed posters, informational posters, uh, you know, translated into the local dialect that explain all these fundamentals. And the folks really like it because they want something that they can put at the model garden to help explain uh, the whole meaning of it. And also they really like it because they're free, they're featured in these posters. So this gentleman here who's reading the poster, you know, you can't see it, but this is his picture here because he's been one of the really successful participants who's, who's taken off with this um, system. So the Cursus students and Torian and the local farmers get together and work real hard to see with new eyes their surroundings. And what I mean by that is all the resources that they have lying all around them that they can use for free in their farms. These green leaves are loaded with nitrogen. Brown leaves uh, give the carbon that's needed for the soil ecosystem. There's no shortage of vegetable waste and banana peels, which are great. Um, like I said, they're cooking with uh, charcoal, so they've got lots of extra char in the kitchen, which is great for the soil. And we use it to make compost. Uh, these leaves that people usually burn as a garbage pile, they can now turn into a fertilizer that's free, uh, better than the expensive, you know, chemical fertilizers that are bad for the environment, and um, and that they can really produce this all the time. So the next step is Torian explains the garden design, and this is a very specific design that we learned first from Peter Jensen, and then we've learned from others that employ what we call climate smart techniques where we're trying to maximize um, every free resource, and that includes water. So the rainwater that comes off of the roofs and is usually just washing away should be maximized and harnessed in the garden. And um, so he, first we draw out the design in the, in the dirt, and then everybody gets to work. And they, they, it's really amazing to watch Malagasy folks work together. I mean, they are synchronized and they're singing and laughing and joking the whole time. And the whole day goes by in the blink of an eye because you're having such a good time. They dig these deep pits and fill it with all that delicious organic matter I was showing you, all the compost materials to bring that soil back to life. And then they add a touch of spices to the top. The black is that char. The gray is the ash. These are eggshells. Uh, and these greens are nitrogen-rich leaves. This combination is just going to kickstart the life in that soil for the next uh, round of farming. And so these raised beds, you know, they're created, like I said, by stuffing the earth full of organics. Uh, we're not bringing in soil from anywhere else. And notice how uh, expertly Torian here 
has helped the folks to design this expanded channel system where rainwater can come down this channel, pools in these holes that are filled with rocks to prevent erosion, and excess water then gets funneled all the way around the garden, watering the whole place for you. All these little grasses you see, these are lemongrass, which is great for a tea, and vetiver grass, and the two of them combined plant deep roots that can hold that soil together, preventing erosion. They grow into a hedge that keeps down wind erosion and keeps the chickens out. The participants are all extremely grateful. They're really having a, a great time, and we provide them with uh, seeds to get them started with their own garden. And it's only a small amount. I wish we could give a lot more, but we start with just a cup of corn, a cup of beans, a cup of greens, and, uh, and this is really enough to get them started with their own experimenting. And they're super grateful because they've been telling us that their main coping strategy in an economic crisis like this is to grow vegetable crops that have a fast turnaround. In three to six months, they can already be harvesting and selling greens, tomatoes, and vegetables like that to make enough money to kind of get by and also, you know, have enough to invest in the next round of farming. So it's, they're really appreciative and we're learning a lot from them about how this is fundamental to how Malagasy cope with, with this kind of situation. We've also um, compiled cropping calendars and we're teaching about crop rotation. Crop rotation is a really fundamental step where, you know, first we grow beans because the beans put nitrogen and other good minerals into the soil. And then after the beans are done, we can plant corn because corn requires a lot of nitrogen. And so by building up the soil with that first round of beans, now we rotate to another crop. And that's having many benefits that I won't get into, but it's also increasing the income diversification. So people have a harvest all throughout the year that they can um, have some food for the house and some food to sell. And people have an intimate knowledge, this local traditional ecological knowledge, which we have gleaned from them and combined with data from the Food and Agriculture Organization to comp compile these really precise calendars, which crops should be planted in which months. And they really, really enjoy this. Um, switching gears again, I'm, I'm just gonna wrap up, uh, I'm running out of time, but environmental education is fundamental to conservation. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of folks, you know, 70% of them are only gonna get a primary school education. So that's your chance to make it clear why is the environment important, not just for saving lemurs, but for people, for, for public health, for natural resource management. So here's Lantu, who's been uh, passionate about education since the early days of Sava conservation. He led this workshop, or what I like to call a think tank, where we've put together a lot of different stakeholders and actors, teachers, educators at nature preserves, um, uh, administrators at the Ministry of Education, local people like Evra, who are starting their own interpretive centers and, and educational gardens, and put them all together to really come up with the, 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 the next best plan in environmental education. You know, school's closed, we can't work with the kids, the teachers are out of work. So we said, this is, let's turn lemons into lemonade, let's make an opportunity out of this. And now we're starting a series of these think tanks to get people talking. And we have a lot of different voices at the table. We also have this excellent outdoor classroom that gives us some space. So here's Beatrice, she's a teacher at Cursa, but not the university, but she's interested in environmental education at all levels. Evra, who's starting his own garden and interpretive center and wants to, um, to really start right. And so, and here also we have uh, Radu and Ertis who are local educators at a nature preserve. And um, together we gave them the task and these tables to fill out, what are your goals? What are the big impacts we're trying to have? What are the achievable goals? What are the outputs that we can really quantify and say how many people are we reaching? Then what are the activities that we can do to meet those goals? And what are the inputs we need, the resources, the people power? So this is only the first step. Um, and like I said, we're trying to combine a, a lot of different things. You know, one of uh, DLC's um, main projects in the past was training teachers using this manual that they're, they've all got copies of the manual um, this is, was a manual that was created with um, Ministry of Environment uh, and Ministry of Education educators to incorporate environmental education into the curriculum. And so one thing is teaching it in the classroom, 
But another thing is bringing kids out to have the experience in nature and see it firsthand, experience it, feel it, touch it, smell it. Um, and so Radu here, who works at the Makulin uh, Private Nature Reserve, is a, an expert at interpreting nature for children at all levels. And our goal is really to combine these things, the classroom, the nature experience, and active learning um, activities. You know, in, the, in the, a lot of high-income countries, we've been talking about active learning is better than passive learning because you can get kids actively engaged. And so we're trying to, you know, work with this group and engaging more stakeholders to, to do more and more uh, along these lines. And our goal is that by the time schools open up after COVID is, is you know, safely behind us, we'll have a new environmental education program ready to, to hit the ground running. Another environmental activity I'm just going to touch on really quickly as I run out of time is um, there's the National Day of the Environment that was held. Um, and it was, uh, you know, pretty well attended given that we're trying to be uh, small groups with Corona. But here the Curse of Students, they partnered with us to have a booth together sharing posters and everything about what we're doing. Again, always with the hand sanitizers and, and posters about COVID. Um, but one of the things that really got me about this event was that it was attended by a lot, a lot of local politicians and the Curse of Students actually presented these posters for the governor. And so for them to have this opportunity to share not only what they've learned, but what they've experienced, what they've done with the governor, um, that I, really was very meaningful and impactful for me, at least. So next steps, just to, to give you an idea of where we're going for the rest of 2020 is, like I said, we're working with that network of doctors and biologists to donate um, the personal protective equipment and do information campaigns for the remote clinics that really need it most. Um, we're following up with all that reforestation, maintenance, and protection that's so key. Um, we're actually establishing some new uh, nurseries uh, with, with the help of CURSA and local communities, new tree nurseries to produce, our goal is to produce 100,000 seedlings ourselves, um, in addition to what the ministry is doing and what the MMP is doing. We're going to continue with the agroecology workshops, new workshops at new villages, as well as returning to the previous uh, villages to continue to consult. We're training a, a really powerful and brilliant team of CURSA students to, to, to be the people that disseminate and, and do the extension services. We're gonna be doing that fish harvest pretty soon, so stay tuned for the fish fry. Um, more environmental education think tanks. We're gonna get this, this really innovative program started. I'm running out of breath to tell you about just next week, we're going to have a, a, a campaign with fuel efficient stoves. Um, we do these stoves. I told you about the charcoal and the significant impact of charcoal. Well, we, we work with a group that has these stoves that cut the use of charcoal in half. Uh, and we're going to be distributing those and doing information campaigns about those next week. Continuing to serve the women in the community with reproductive health outreach and, uh, and more. But uh, with that, I'm just going to take a, a breath and say thank you all for listening, and I'll take any questions you have. And, of course, thank you to all the sponsors that make this work possible. All right. All right. Thank you, James. It's great to see that, you know, even in a challenging time, there's still a lot of really good conservation work uh, happening. You know, I know it's probably frustrating to kind of coordinate it from a distance, but it's good to see that a lot is still happening. Yeah. Yeah. And then it seems like education, you know, all these projects, education really is the key is, you know, education, providing resources and tools, and that can go a long way um, in conservation work, good conservation work. All right. So we have Genevieve and Juliet joining us in Oshawa. I can see Genevieve has her hand up, so I'm going to bring them into the call. Go ahead, Genevieve. Can we actually take just a, a second because there's a little bit of a lag? Okay. Yep. Um, do animals need to be quarantined when they get the corona, the coronavirus, or with any other viruses? So I finally caught up. There was a little bit of a lag and a and a repeat in the in the broadcast. But um, yeah. So especially when we're talking about captive animals. Animals that are either either bringing the animals into captivity for the first time, they usually have to be quarantined for several weeks to a month. 
to make sure to do the veterinary testing and, and, and see to it that they're, that they're healthy. Um, that's always a, a precaution you take when captive animals. So in this case, yes, you would definitely, if you suspect that the animal has coronavirus, you'd have to quarantine them and, and keep them separate from the rest of the captive population. In the wild, it's very hard to tell, you know, that nature has taken its course. All right. Thank you. Great question. Uh, James, another one for you about, you know, you, you shared uh, the crops and how, you know, having a mixture of crops, um, you know, some shading others, others harvested at different times can really be productive. Do you find, um, you know, that that's, that's a bit of a tough sell? Do farmers, you know, are they so focused on you clear the land, have the one kind of crop? Is it hard to kind of get that message or do you find they're pretty receptive? It varies. Um, there has been a lot of agricultural outreach in Madagascar because of the, the development projects. And so in some places you will have folks that have already had a little taste of these kinds of techniques. A lot of them traditionally already do these things like, for example, they'll plant rice and corn together. Um, so that's kind of something they do traditionally. You know, in some ways that works. In other ways, you can, you can do it in a more efficient way because rice and corn are using, they both need a lot of nitrogen. So they're using the same nutrients. Whereas if you do corn and beans, the corn is using nitrogen, the beans are giving nitrogen. So that's a good combination. Uh, but in some areas, no, it's like a very foreign idea. And especially because rice is such a big staple crop, um, they don't wanna sacrifice any land to other crops when rice is so fundamental. But I think we're really making headway. You know, you see a lot of those kind of aha moments and the eyes brightening like a light bulb just went off where they're like that just makes sense and then we see them implementing it right away all right very good um sticking to that crop uh idea do you are you do you introduce um you know varieties or seeds for them that might be a little more tolerant a little more tolerant to maybe areas that have lost soil or maybe a little more drought tolerant that's an interesting question because yeah that is a big push with a lot of development projects is to, to have um, varieties and really um, good seeds that you know the germination rate's gonna be good. You know, it's a variety that's well adapted. But, you know, a, a, big, a big thing that we practice at DLC Sava, and we learned a lot of this from Peter Jensen from the Terra Firma International that they've had, you know, 30 years of experience doing this. Accessibility is like the fundamental number one barrier for these remote smallholder farmers. If we're talking about you need seeds that come from a company from abroad and they're gonna cost a lot of money and you gotta to go to the city to get them, they, it's already out of the question. Yeah. The seeds that we provide come directly from the local markets where any other person could go and buy them themselves. And you know, it's a matter of choosing the good ones because there are some that are just over dried and not good for planting, but um, making it clear for people you have these things all around you. You just need to maximize them. Yeah. So James, obviously you're doing things differently than usual. Um, from the presentation, clearly, um, you know, you're adapting well to these new challenges. Sounds like there's lots on the go that's keeping you busy. But what would you say is your biggest lesson or takeaway, um, you know, from the last few months going from, you know, being used to being in country, uh, you know, more hands on on the ground. What's kind of your biggest takeaway, your biggest lesson? Well, that's a, that's a deep one. Um, but I would say, you know, you are, have been a, a, a kind of an inspiration for me too, with your virtual means of, of disseminating information to a broader audience. Um, so we've, we've had to adapt and we've had to figure out how to do a lot of things virtually. And, it, you know, I went several weeks or months of like silence where I couldn't get in touch with anyone. And we gradually chipped away at it to figure out, okay, you know, through Facebook Messenger or through Zoom or Skype or one way or another, we'll make it work. And we can actually, I've, I've had a great success communicating with folks, even when they're out in very remote country villages um, via Facebook and, and these different media. So I'd say it's been a learning to adapt to the virtual landscape, which I think is going to become more and more common now that we've been forced into it a little bit we're realizing that there actually are some benefits. Like I've been able to, to do things I couldn't have done otherwise with this virtual media platform. So that's what, that would be the big thing I've learned in the last few months. 
but also I just want to give credit to the the resilience of Malagasy people. I mean, that's I'm constantly amazed at how resilient they are to these, you know, this is basically another hiccup or speed bump to them, but they're going to get through it. For us, it's, you know, causing a recession that most of us are really, really suffering. These folks are suffering, but they have the means to to figure it out and to keep to keep pushing for survival. And that's really inspiring. Yeah. Well, it looks like you have an incredible team on the ground. James, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for sharing uh, the updates because you know, we do hear a lot in the media of what's going wrong. So it's, it's nice to hear, uh, you know, some stories where, you, you know, people are finding some success and they're making things work in a challenging situation. So uh, huge thank you for joining us today uh, and sharing that story with us. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And I hope it, um, you know, I hope it does bring a little bit of a bright spot in between all the bad news we hear. Um, I, I really look forward to every weekend when I get updates from the team. Um, because that gets me through the through the rest of the week. All right. Well, a huge shout out to Genevieve and Julia. Thanks for joining us in Oshawa. Thank you to the viewers on Facebook uh, and YouTube for tuning in today as well. And James, we will see you hopefully in a couple of months and get an update on the projects. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to it. Take care, everyone. Thanks for watching. All right. Thanks, everyone.